Welcome everybody to our Easter service. Um, I'm sad that we're not together, but I feel like there's something to be gained from a moment like this where we can uh, gather by internet and celebrate together the resurrection of the Lord. Uh, I was just thinking that uh, during this time we get to demonstrate to the world that we can still be the church in the middle of this. And so uh, I want you to hold on and uh, let's celebrate together what the Lord has done for us. I want to uh, read a section of scripture out of Isaiah. It's uh, Isaiah 53. I'm going to read from verse 4 to uh, 9-ish. Um, so in verse 4 it says, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. Let's keep in mind that this is um, written, this is Isaiah, so this is prophecy in the Old Testament. So this is roughly 700 years before Jesus actually walked on the earth. And this is prophecy about Jesus. Verse 5 it says, But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was a chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet, yet he opened not his mouth, like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, like a sheep that is before its shearers is silent. So he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. As for this generation, who considered that he was cut off of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people? And they made his grave with the wicked, and with the rich man on his death, although he, although he had done no violence, there was no deceit in his mouth. And then at the bottom of verse 11 it says, By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be announced, anointed righteous and he shall bear their iniquities. So, um, the implication here is that there will be, there's going to come a day whenever a man would walk the earth as God in the flesh, and he would cleanse the world of their sin, and he would bear their righteousness. He would take on, this, bear their sin, I mean, he would take on the iniquities and the sins of the world. Um, so this prophecy is, it gives perfect clarity as to who Jesus would be as to um, how he would live his, his life and for the purpose as to why he would come. Um, I heard yesterday mer yesterday morning on the uh, the Zoom call for the student, for the um, kids ministry, I heard Kara, Kara Doss saying that her son Hezekiah was asking her, he said, why did Jesus stay silent whenever um, they were crucifying him? Why did he, he stay silent whenever they were mocking him? And Kara gave what I thought was a very wise answer. She said, um, because he was, because God had a perfect plan. God had a plan in mind from the beginning. You can see it in Genesis, that God had a plan. When a, Genesis 3, immediately after fa the fall of man, God gives the plan for the redemption of mankind. You can see it here in Isaiah, where God shows the plan that he has for man's re redemption. And then you can see that plan fulfilled in Jesus Christ, that the plan was given and it was fulfilled that man was cleansed of their sin and made to be righteous because of what Jesus did for us. Now that's in his life, that's in his death, and really ultimately that's in his resurrection. It shows that he was not just a man. He wasn't just a man that went to the cross and died for his own sin, but he was God in the flesh. Isaiah, in an earlier point, called him uh, Emmanuel. It means God in the flesh. That God came down and he died for the, um, for the sake of, of mankind. Ultimately, he, ro he rose from the dead. So, um, I'm going to take a moment and pray. Lord, thank you so much um, just for your goodness. Lord, thank you so much for your death on the cross. Thank you for um, dying for the sake of mankind. Lord, thank you for rising from the dead and showing that you are um, the anointed one, that you are the Lord, and you care about your children. Lord, thank you so much for your goodness. And uh, just help us to focus on you, Lord, during this time and to uh, just commit our minds and our thoughts to you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, church, we're going to get ready to worship. So good to be together. And I just want to encourage you. Um, I've watched a lot of different services. And uh, I found that when it comes time to sing, my tendency is just to watch people on the screen sing. And that's not what this is about for us. This is our time to worship together. So I just want to encourage you, wherever you're at with your family, find a posture of worship and let's sing together. Let's worship the Lord. 
and enjoy this time and uh, as we celebrate. Amen. We're going to sing Happy Day. The greatest day in history. Death is beaten. You have rescued me. Sing it out. Jesus is alive. The empty cross. The empty cross. The empty grave. Life eternal, you have won the day. Shout it out, Jesus is alive. He's alive. Oh, happy day. And oh, happy day, happy day. You wash my sin away. Oh, happy day, happy day. I'll never be the same. Forever I am changed. Oh yeah. Verse 2. When I stand in that place, free at last, meeting face to face, I am yours, Jesus, you are mine. Endless joy, and endless joy, perfect peace, and earthly pain. Finally we'll cease Celebrate Jesus is alive He's alive Yes and oh Happy day Happy day You wash my sin away Oh Happy day Happy day I'll never be the same Oh Happy day, happy day, you wash my sin away, oh, happy day, happy day, I'll never be the same, oh no, forever I am changed, yeah, sing it, oh, what a glorious day. And oh, what a glorious day, what a glorious way, yeah, that you have saved me. And oh, what a glorious day, what a glorious day. Wash my sin away, oh, happy day, happy day, I'll never be the same. Lord, we worship you. Thank you, God. All right. See, it's not so hard to sing at your house. You can do it. So our next song we're going to sing is In Christ Alone this morning. And Father, we just acknowledge you together that there's no other hope besides you. There's no one else, Lord. You're the only one. And we celebrate. We sing hallelujah, hosanna. Thank you, Jesus. To our victorious King. Our powerful Lord. The one that's strong enough to save and is so humble that He still comes and He calls us friend. We praise you, Jesus. In Christ alone, my hope is found. And He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace. When fears are stilled, when striving cease, 
my comforter, my all in all. Here in the love of Christ, I stand. Thank you, Jesus. In Christ alone who took on flesh, in Christ alone who took on flesh, fullness of God in her hopeless being, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save, till on that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. For every sin on him was laid, and here in the death of Christ I live, here I live, there in the ground his body lay, the light of the world by darkness slain. Then bursting forth in glorious day Up from the grave he rose again And as he stands in victory Since curse has lost its grip on me For I am his and he is mine, bought with the precious blood of Christ. And as he stands in victory, since curse has lost its grip on me, for I am his, and he is mine, bought with the precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life, no guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to the final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man. from his hand till he returns or calls me home here in the power of Christ I'll stand singing as he stands and as he stands in victory since curse has lost its grip on me for I am his and he is Bought with the precious blood of Christ, for I am His, and He is mine. We're bought with the precious blood of Christ. Praise the Lord. worship you. Thank you for the high price you paid, Jesus. Thank you so much that you're strong enough to be raised from the dead and prove who you are is true. All your promises are true and you have the power to fulfill them. We don't have to wonder anymore. As if there ever was a time where we should have wondered, but you came and you quelched every fear Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Lord. The sin came to my rescue. So we're acknowledging today that he came to our rescue. He's given us new life. He's overcome. And we share in that victory, not because we deserve it, because he chose to invite us into it. And our world needs to be different because of what he's done in us. It needs to be different because of how we live, because of how we recognize what he's done. So 
Let's worship together. So I'm falling on my knees. Falling on my knees and worship, giving all I am to seek your face. Lord, all I am is yours. My whole life. My whole life I place in your hands God of mercy, humbled I bow down In your presence at your throne I call And I call you answer and you came to my rescue and I I want to be where you are yes. and I call and I call you answer And you came to my rescue and I, I want to be where you are. Take my whole life I place, my whole life I place in your hands, God of Mercy, humbled I bow down in your presence at your throne. Oh, I call and I call you answer, and you my rescue and I, I want to be where you are, yeah, I call, oh, I call, you answer, and you came to my rescue and I. I want to be where you are, yeah, in my life, oh, oh, in my life, oh, be lifted high in the world, be lifted high in our love.
And we're really so grateful that part of your big plan in all this is that we would have a relationship with you. And that we have a glorious future that goes even beyond this life, beyond this world. Lord, we're going to be in heaven with you. We're going to be gathered together where no virus, no scheme of man will be able to separate us. We'll be joined to you perfectly in spirit, Lord, and in your presence physically. And we just say we're excited for that day. Thank you, Jesus. We praise you, Lord. Amen. What a special time of worship and song that is. And I hope that that's your heart's cry and prayer is that in our lives, in our world, and on our love to one another, that Christ would be lifted high. And this is what this is all about. As we gather together in our living rooms, in the same city, um, across the state, across uh, not only the U.S., but even around the world, as we know some of you are viewing, that we can show the love of Christ to one another, that it draws people in to wonder, who is this God that you're serving? Because the love that we have for him and one another. So as we go into this time of prayer, I pray that you would even lift up your voices in your home or wherever you find yourself, gather together with your family. If you're by yourself, that's okay. The Lord hears you. He knows your heart cry and we can thank him for who he is and agree together as we pray. So join with us right now. Lord, we just thank you that you are a God that's in control of all that is going on around us, that you are a God that hears our cry and you know our hearts, Lord, better than we know ourselves. And so, Lord, we just want to lift up your name. Jesus, we thank you that you are the author and finisher of our faith, that you are the creator, that you are the one that we have proclaimed already, that is the savior of the world, the savior of our souls. And so, God, I pray right now for everyone that knows you and is called according to your purposes, that has accepted you as Lord and Savior, that we would not take for granted this salvation, this free gift of life that we have uh, from you, just freely given to us. So we honor you, we praise your name, and we thank you um, for loving us, God. We thank you for the passionate pursuit that you had upon us, that you um, sought us out, you loved us first before we even loved you or even known of you. So God, we thank you and we praise your name. I pray for the lost right now, that maybe you're even watching and you're wondering, what is this? What, what is this all about? Who is this Jesus? I pray that the lost would come to that saving knowledge of who you are, Jesus, and what you have done for us in the death on the cross for our sins and in the life that you give to us by the power that was shown in your resurrection. So God, I just pray that not only through the service, but in the hours, in the days to come, that the lost would just hear your voice and they'd come to know you. And God, right now, we just look to you as, again, the one that's in control of everything, everything that's around us. And Lord, as we look and we feel sometimes that it's all chaotic and uncertain around us, we know that you are the constant. You are the never-changing God. And so, God, I just pray that we fix our eyes upon you as we pray against this COVID virus. We pray against anybody that's going through any kind of individual need that you might feel like you're being overlooked because of just the things that are going around the world. But God sees you, and I pray that God would meet you right there and where you're at to meet the needs. As we cry out to you, Lord, that we would receive healing of not only physical bodies, but healing of the heart and healing of our souls by the salvation that you give. So, Lord, again, we just honor you. We pray that you would um, just move in our midst. We pray for the health care workers and those that are the first responders, um, for our firefighters, our paramedics, our EMTs, the police officers, um, any that I'm missing, uh, God, the hospital workers and doctors, God, be with them and protect them, Lord, especially. Um, and uh, that, God, that you would minister to their hearts, Lord, as they're ministering to others on the front lines. And so, God, again, we thank you that you are so faithful to us. Help us to be faithful to you and show forth our love in this world today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We want to encourage you guys that if you have any prayer needs throughout the week to call or text anybody at the church, any of our staff members or leadership team members, um, also anybody else in the church. This is a great opportunity for you guys to call on the church body to pray for one another. I was thinking about how it's been about a month since we've been able to meet together as the church body physically, um, that it's so important for us to stay connected with one another. And one of the great ways that we can stay connected is calling on each other to pray. So there's many things that we can be praying for. So pick up your phones, FaceTime, Zoom, Skype calls, whatever it might be, and call and let's bring together some prayer teams 
to pray for one another and with each other. If you um, also visit our webpage, AK Maranatha, or our Facebook page, Maranatha Fellowship, you can find updates to um, what's going on with our services, as well as some COVID-19 updates and how that affects our church. But we do have services for all age groups, from young adults to youth to children's ministry um, to the kids. And if you've missed any of those services, they are also available online for you to watch later on. Um, otherwise, we just want to encourage you guys to tune in to all of those different services to, again, stay connected with one another. Also on the webpage is more information. Um, if you haven't seen the tutorial on how to give your tithes and offerings, at this time we're going to just take a moment to turn our attention to the Lord in our giving. Zach's going to lead us in a worship song, and we're just going to give back to the Lord on what he's blessed us with. So as I pray, we're going to turn over um, this time to Zach. Lord, we just thank you for this opportunity that we have to give back to you of our finances. And we thank you, Lord, that you're our provider and that even during this time for so many, there's uncertainty with finances. But God, we can trust that you're going to provide for all of our needs. And so, Lord, as we faithfully give to you what you blessed us with, would you bless and honor every family um, that is represented in our church and even those who are tuning in today. And we thank you again for being our provider and we thank you, God, um, that you're a good God in the midst of um, in the midst of this time. So would you bless this offering to the furtherance of your kingdom in Jesus' name. Amen. God sent his son. They called him Jesus, and he came to love, heal and forgive. He lived and died to buy my. An empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives. Because he lives. Because he lives. I can face tomorrow. Because the 
Well, I don't know if you've uh, been able to sense it at home, but it's kind of an emotional time here in this room, and Zach's done a great job leading, and um, you can sense that there's a lot of um, emotion to what uh, we're singing about here, and so I hope that came through. And I hope, too, that uh, this hasn't been a time where you felt isolated and disconnected, but that through these sessions you've been able to see... Um, the community that we have as the church. And uh, I'd like you to remember that while you're singing at home, that you're not the only one singing, but that there are others that are singing as well, and there are others that are participating in this in their home. And uh, we can see that a little more on Wednesday nights. If you haven't been with us on Wednesday nights, join us on Wednesday nights because uh, we get to do a Zoom call where we're kind of all connected. And if you, lo you watched this last week, uh, you get to see Pastor as a blockhead for quite a while. So uh, that was a lot of fun. I uh, hope you'll tune in next time for that. Uh, also, uh, during this time, it's occurred to me that it can be a challenge to our faith that we're not uh, with the body of Christ in the same way that we typically are. We, we have to rely upon the fact that that's true, even though we're not there in person. And so it requires us to really draw on strength from the Lord. And I hope you're doing that and realizing that this can be a challenge to faith, and challenges to faith can be good. Uh, even though they don't always feel good at the time. It can challenge us in the depths of faith to really understand who we are in Christ. And then uh, also it can be a challenge of character. Uh, sometimes being cooped up like this can bring out things in ourselves that we didn't know were there, especially uh, when we start to see what C.S. Lewis calls little pinpricks happen where uh, things in our lives or in our relationships, they start to get on our nerves because we've been around people a little too much. Now that's not true at our house but probably that's true in many homes. And if that's the case, uh, I would just like you to know that um, that's one of the ways that God develops us and purges us and makes us stronger in Him. And so sometimes seeing those things in ourselves are not things that we like to see, but they're things that God wants to bring to the surface in a way that He can purge it away. And so uh, I, I don't know that that's true of anybody out there, but if there are the challenges that you're facing during this time, I want to encourage you that this can also be a part of God's discipleship process of bringing us to places of maturity. Today I want to talk about um, the resurrection, obviously. You would be disappointed if we, we came with any other message, and I would be disappointed in myself. And so we want to talk about this uh, today, and I'd like you to note that the the resurrection of Jesus is the central message of the sermons in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 13 is where we'll look. So I want to give you a moment to turn there. And while you're turning to Acts 13 on your phone or tablet or in your old-fashioned hard copy Bible that uh, I know many of us are still like to carry and read from, uh, we'll, we'll start at verse 13, and the background of this is that Paul is on his first missionary journey. You know that he was converted to Christ out of a, um, a skeptical view towards who Jesus was, and Christ met him on the Damascus Road and, and turned his life around. And uh, At first, the church didn't want to accept him. Uh, then eventually it did, and he became a powerful uh, voice for the, the gospel of Christ. Well, this is first missionary journey. They've traveled through um, Cyprus with Barnabas. They're, they've come into uh, a, a, an, er, an area of Turkey known as Pisidia. And this other Antioch, different from the one where the, the church meets in the early part of the chapter, this is called Pisidian Antioch. And Paul begins to preach the gospel there. They go into the synagogue, and when they're in the synagogue, he's invited to preach. Let me read to you from that passage, Acts chapter 13, and starting at verse 12, excuse me, verse 13. From Paphos, Paul and his companions sailed to Perga and Pamphylia, where John left them to return to Jerusalem. From Perga, they went on to Pisidian Antioch, and on the Sabbath, they entered the synagogue and sat down. And after reading from the law and the prophets, 
the leaders of the synagogue sent word to them, saying to Paul and Barnabas, Brothers, if you have a word of exhortation for the people, please speak. And so uh, Paul, being a visitor in this city and going to the synagogue, gets the opportunity to share something. And standing up, it says, he motioned with his hand, and he said, Fellow Israelites and you Gentiles who worship God, listen to me. The God of the people of Israel chose our ancestors. He made the people prosper during the stay in Egypt with mighty power. He led them out of that country. For about 40 years, he endured their conduct in the wilderness, and he overthrew seven nations in Canaan. I just think it's funny. It says he endured their conduct. Uh, we were just talking about how God sometimes uh, is uh, putting us in situations where uh, he's he has to endure our conduct, and uh, I see that with the Israelites here. But he, he, it says, it goes on to say that he led them out of that country. He endured their conduct in the wilderness. He overthrew seven nations in Canaan, giving their land to his people and his inher as their inheritance. All this took about 450 years. So in two paragraphs, Paul moves through 450 years of history. After this, God gave them judges until the time of Samuel, the prophet, and then the people asked for a king. And he gave them Saul, son of Kish of the tribe of Benjamin, who ruled 40 years. And after removing Saul, uh, he made David their king. And God testified concerning him, I found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. So it's quickly moved here from God choosing a people to choosing a king. And it goes even further than that. Uh, and Paul is just moving at rapid pace. They would have all picked up on this because they would have known the background and the history that went along with it. But then it says this, From this man's descendant, David, uh, God has brought to Israel the Savior Jesus as he promised. Before the coming of Jesus, John preached repentance and baptism to all the people of Israel. As John was completing his work, he said, Why do you, Who do you suppose I am? I'm not the one you're looking for, but there's one coming after me whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. Fellow children of Abraham and you God-fearing Gentiles, it is to us that this message of salvation has been sent. The people of Jerusalem and their rulers did not recognize Jesus, yet in condemning him they fulfilled the words of the prophets that are read every Sabbath. Though they found no proper ground for a death sentence, they asked Pilate to have him executed. And when they carried out all that was written about him, they took him down from the cross and laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead, and for many days uh, he was seen by those who had traveled with him from Galilee to Jerusalem. They are now witnesses to our people. We tell you the good news, what God has promised our ancestors, he has fulfilled for us, their children, by raising up Jesus. And as it is written in the second psalm, you are my son, today I have become your father. God raised him from the dead so that he will never be subject to decay. As God has said, I will give you the holy and sure blessings promised to David. So it, will also, so it was also stated elsewhere, you will not let your holy one see decay. Now when David had served God's purpose in his own generation, he fell asleep. He was buried with his ancestors and his body decayed. But the one whom God raised from the dead did not see decay. Therefore, my friends, I want you to know that through Jesus... The forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. Through him, everyone who believes is set free from sin, a justification you are not able to obtain under the law of Moses. Take care. What the prophets have said does not happen to you. Look, you scoffers, wonder and perish, for I'm going to do something in your days that you would not ever believe, even if someone told you. So here we have the sermon that was preached by the Apostle Paul at Pisidian Antioch. And I want to talk a little bit about this and unpack this a little bit because I think there's something important for us to understand. It's, it's what is the resurrection of Christ really about? Um, is it about uh, just us being forgiven of sins so that when we die we can go to heaven, or is it much more than that? Uh, I would suggest to you it's much more than uh, us just getting a free ticket out of hell and into heaven. God is doing something far greater in the resurrection of Christ. Uh, God's not just uh, proving that there's life after death. Most of the first hearers of this message would have already believed that there was life after death. So the resurrection of Jesus is not proof that there's life after death, although it is proof of that, but that's not the point. Uh, the point goes much deeper than that. The resurrection is God's vindication of Jesus as Lord and King. Remember last week we talked about the triumphal entry and how there was, uh, in 
the triumphal entry may be a mistaken uh, view of what Jesus was really trying to do. And then there were some who wanted him dead and they were trying to remove him. And, uh, and so the triumphal entry was kind of this coronation procession that was welcoming Jesus as king. But by the end of the week, Christ was crucified. And so a lot of maybe half-hearted hopes were disappointed. Some had put their full hope in Christ and they were disappointed as well. They didn't really know exactly what they were doing, but uh, they were on the right track. They had, th those who wanted him to be king were on the right track. They had the right person. They probably just had the wrong thing in mind at the moment. That Christ was doing something far greater than they realized. And so uh, we're seeing in the resurrection God's vindication that he is king, that Jesus is king, despite the fact that after the triumphal entry, he was taken to the cross, which looked like a dead end. It looked like a defeat. The resurrection proves that Jesus is God's man, that he is Messiah. So Paul starts out in this message with God's work. And one way you can kind of outline this passage is by looking at what God does at each step of the way. I think that's central to this message is that what Christ is doing, God was working all along through this passage. It tells us that God chose Israel. If you look at the first few verses there, he chose Israel. He set them apart for a special purpose. What did he choose Israel apart? Did he just want a people that he could love on? I think it's far greater than that. I think what God was doing in choosing Israel was setting aside a people through whom one particular individual could ultimately come and, and through that individual he could bring people from every tr uh, tongue and tribe and nation into community and into relationship with himself. So he chose Israel, but in choosing Israel he was really choosing the whole world, those who would follow him. Then it shows us that God delivered Israel. He, he gives us uh, a deliverance from Egypt. He uses through the period of judges special kinds of deliverers who are very unlikely. Many of them are surprising in their ability to deliver. Like you wouldn't expect this person to do uh, this particular thing. They had some kind of glaring weakness of one kind or another. And so even there, there are, there are types and shadows of what Jesus is going to do is that he doesn't look like the kind of king that would come and reign and yet he's the very one that's going to be God's answer to man's problem. So he delivered Israel and then he gave leaders to Israel, the judges, and then later on they asked for a king and Saul was a king. He was kind of a, a guy that you would look up to and say, man, he looks like a natural born leader. And then uh, Saul, because of uh, his humility, began to quickly fade away and pride took its place. Uh, God rejected him as king because of some errors that he made as a response from his pride. And he chose David, a man after his own heart. And I, I would suggest to you that David was probably the unlikely leader that out of all of his brothers, they didn't even call him in to be anointed when Samuel came to anoint a king in his family. Uh, the youngest of all the brothers, and God chose him. And uh, They finally called him in after Samuel says, these guys aren't the ones, do you have another? And So they bring David in and God pours out on him the anointing. Uh, after that, he slays Goliath and then he goes on the run from King Saul for about 13 years and he leads a band of misfits. And finally, his time comes and he becomes the leader of Israel. And uh, he has failures. Uh, he has times when his faith, it seems, lapses or he begins to take credit for some of the things God does. But really the, the theme of his life is that he's a man after God's heart. So God chooses him. And David has in his heart to do what pleases God. And so he builds a house and in Jerusalem when he conquers Jerusalem and then he wants to take the tabernacle and he wants to build a permanent place for that and, and the prophet Nathan says to him go ahead you should do that and Nathan uh, Nathan uh, goes home that night and God says to him that's not for David to do you need to go back and tell him uh, that I want to build a house out of him and so Nathan returns the next day and he says God wants to build a house out of you and David's response is he's overwhelmed. He's like, who am I that God would want to build a house out of me? And he begins to understand something profound, that God is doing something that is going to be the law for all mankind from this point forward. God chose the leaders. And then out of the leaders, he brought the Savior. And you can go through this and you can see it as you follow along in that passage. And then finally, it says that God raised Jesus from the dead. Um, 
And he did this for several reasons. Paul, Paul uh, went through this whole process for several reasons. One, he did this to connect to his immediate audience. He wanted them to know these fellow Israelites and fearers of God that they were standing on common ground. Fellow Israelites, obviously, are, are people who are descended from Abraham, but uh, God-fearers or those who fear God are a group of people who would have been Gentile converts to Judaism, and they would have trusted in the same scriptures, and they would look for the same hope and the same Messiah. And so uh, bringing those two people together, Paul is saying, I've got a message that's relevant to you because these are your scriptures. And they would have been sympathetic to the message for the most part. Paul knew where to start with them. He also seems to know where to start with Gentiles, but, but here he has common ground and they have a common history. The second reason Paul goes through all of this is he wants to connect to the past by recalling what God has brought them through as the people of God. And I think the point here is that everything God was doing in the past was to lead up to this future moment. Okay, so uh, he's connecting them to their past and saying, look, God chose a people. He chose leaders. He chose a king and he planned a future king through all of this and that's the third thing is that this connects the people that Paul's talking to to the purpose that uh, for, for which all this has happened and God established a nation he delivered them he placed them so that they could welcome a deliverer God's purpose was ultimately to choose a man and his purpose was uh, to make all of that uh, begin to unfold he focuses on one person from the past and one from the present. So I'd like you to notice in this passage, if you go back a little bit, that David's the one who received the promise. David's name comes up again and again here. David's the one who received the promise. And, and I, I paraphrased a little bit about what happened in 2 Samuel 7, but here's a, a quote from that. This is the promise that his throne would be an everlasting throne. David's throne would be an everlasting throne. Now, it's impossible for David to rule on that throne, as we find out in just a moment, because he's going to die. But there will be a descendant from him that will rule forever. Listen, 2 Samuel 7, verse 16, Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. That's a, a promise that God makes to David. Now, David's not the fulfillment of that promise. The, he's just the recipient of it. The fulfillment of the promise is to Jesus. Jesus fulfilled the promise. The promise came to David, but it was not for David. It was for one of his descendants to fulfill. In Luke chapter 1, verse 32 through 33, this is uh, really kind of a beautiful verse in light of all that we've been talking about. Uh, God speaks to uh, Mary through the angel Gabriel. And he says, you're going to have a son. And she's overwhelmed and not sure what to make about this. I haven't even been with a, a man. How is this going to happen? And the angel says to her, he will be great and he will be called son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David, and he'll reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. And then I have a list of probably eight to ten other references that confirm that right here. Okay, so this is God's promise to them that it's going to be fulfilled through Jesus. And also he goes on to quote, Paul does. The, the confidence um, of David in Psalm chapter 16, verse 10, he says, uh, David says this in Psalm 16, 10, because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, nor will you let your faithful one see decay. So then Paul applies this and he says that wasn't talking about David. And we know that because, and he says this in verse 36 and 37, now when David had served God's purpose, in his own generation, he fell asleep and he was buried with his ancestors and his body decayed. Okay, uh, But the one whom God raised from the dead did not see decay. Jesus didn't stay in the ground long enough for his body to go through the full process of decay. He was raised on the third day. Now, I, I don't think we should take a lot of time for this, but you know that in the Jewish accounting for this, that if you have parts of days, that accounts for the three days. So he goes in Friday night, he raises Sunday morning. Uh, that doesn't seem like a full three days when you think about it, but he was in the ground, he was buried for the parts of three days, and in their accounting they would have called that three days having been dead. So there's not enough time for his body to decay in the middle of this. He was raised to life. And so all of Israel's history 
is moving towards this one moment, the kingdom of God coming through Jesus. N.T. Wright, in his book, How God Became King, says the resurrection is the central focus of this. And he says the resurrection is, from Mark's point of view, the moment when God's kingdom comes in power. From John's point of view, it's the launching of the new creation, the new Genesis. From Matthew's point of view, it brings Jesus into the position for which he was always destined, that of the world's rightful Lord, sending out his followers as a new Roman emperor might send out his emissaries, but with methods that match the message to call the world to follow him and learn this new way of being human. From Luke's point of view, the resurrection is the moment when Israel's Messiah comes into his glory so that repentance for the forgiveness of sins can now be announced to all the world as the new way of life. Indeed, as they, uh, as they say in Acts, as the way of life, with a capital W. Once we put the kingdom and the cross together, he goes on to say in this manner, we have, it is not difficult to see, how the resurrection fits closely with the great combined reality. It's the resurrection that declares that the cross was a victory, not a defeat, it therefore announces that God has indeed become king on the earth as in heaven. He goes on to talk about this, and I'm not going to quote it, but let me paraphrase it, that Jesus Christ is the intersection between heaven and earth, and his resurrection uh, is the moment in which God becomes king. And uh, he talks about Christ being the temple. You remember he, uh, he said in Mark's gospel, and I imagine this is true in Luke and Matthew as well, that you destroy this temple in three days I'll raise it again. And he said he was speaking of his body, not the temple, not the literal temple. He was speaking of his body as the temple. And Christ's body has become the intersection of heaven and earth. So it's in him now we have the temple and we don't, we don't any longer need to go to a particular location on earth. We have in Jesus that intersection between the divine and the human. He's our temple, and he allows us to become the temple of the Holy Spirit. Through the resurrection, uh, he's been crowned king. And the irony is that the world, uh, what they did through half-hearted motives and the triumphal entry and what the soldier did when they, uh, they mocked Jesus and put the crown of thorns on his head, what Herod did when he put the mock robe on Jesus, Christ called them on their irony and got the last laugh. God got the last laugh by establishing him as the true king. Imagine what that must look like for those who mocked him in such a way when they really stood before him. It's a powerful thought. Think of what Jesus called the resurrection. See, he's crowned king in this. Peter calls the resurrection his glorification. Isaiah chapter 53, which Joe read, uh, there's part of verse 11 that says this, after he suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. And by his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many and he will bear their iniquities. Paul says in Philippians 2, verse 8 through 11, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him a name above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. All of these are talking about how in his resurrection he is vindicated as the true and rightful Lord of the world. And that's what the resurrection message is about, is that Jesus is king. Three, there's three promises um, that are mentioned in this passage that I think are important for us to understand as we think about the resurrection. The first is that there will be a resurrection. You'll notice if you look through um, a concordance at the word raised, for example, you'll notice in uh, Matthew's gospel that Jesus again and again, I think something like five times, he tells his disciples before he goes to the cross that he will rise again. He tells them that. And for some reason, they're not getting it. It's not till afterwards that they remember what he said, but he promised that he would be, he would raise to newness of life. And Matthew's gospel is really, if you were to give it a, a, a label or a theme, it's the gospel of the king. Okay, So he's talking about there how his resurrection is vindication of his authority. Remember, when Jesus was raised, he said, all authority on heaven and earth have been, has been given to me. So his 
uh, his resurrection is a demonstration or a vindication of his great authority. The second is enthronement. So this promise we see uh, in this passage that we're reading. He says, today you're my son. Uh, you've become my son. Today I've begotten you, which is an enthronement um, section. This is read over all of the descendants of David, that each one of them, when they came to the throne, when they ascended to the throne as part of their coronation, uh, you, today you've become my son. Today I've become your father. This is a recognition of his enthronement. Jesus didn't become the son of God when he raised from the dead. He was already the son of God, but he was, he was recognized for the king of the world at that moment. Okay, so enthronement. And then the third thing is reconciliation. Through the resurrected Christ, we're offered reconciliation. He's not dead. We can have a relationship with Christ today. He's risen. And so uh, there's reconciliation. The death of Christ in our place and his resurrection to lordship. This is called the message of salvation in Acts uh, 13, verse 26. So if you look at verse 26, this is called the message of salvation. And uh, verse 32, this is called the good news. And the result is an invitation to be welcomed into the kingdom of God by our allegiance and devotion to the king. Verse 38 and 39 Paul says, therefore, my friends, this is what he said after he preached. This is what God has done in Israel's history leading up till now. This is what God is doing in Christ. This is what it means to us. Okay, so he makes the application for us in verse 38 through 39. Therefore, my friends, I want you to know that through Jesus, the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. Okay, through him, everyone who believes is set free from every sin, a justification or a righteousness, it's the same word there, you are not able to obtain under the law of Moses. Because he was raised, he can offer. And, and this includes his death, obviously. He died for our sins, taking the punishment of our sins upon himself. As Joe read, he, uh, he bore our sins to the cross. It was God's pleasure to place upon Christ the iniquity of us all. So... There's a great exchange there. There's a forgiveness. And, and there's actually two things that are happening uh, in that. One is that God is not counting our sins against us. He's counting them against Christ. So Jesus stands in as our substitute. The second thing is that he's dealing with the devil in this. Okay, So the enemy has a claim on all the sinful that they are... They are willing collaborators with him. And he's brought them under bondage and into slavery. And in the cross, Christ defeated our enemy, the devil. Okay, so I want you to know that there's two things that are happening. One is he satisfied the guilt that stood against us. And he also, he also ransomed us. He paid our ransom to free us from the enemy. Those two things happen in the cross of Christ. And so now we're called to be reconciled to the rightful king of the world. His resurrection represents for us a jubilee. If you know anything about a jubilee, uh, you know that it's a jubilee that, that debts are forgiven, slaves are set free, and people are restored to their inheritance. That all happens in jubilee, and, and in Christ that represents that. Don't let uh, anything stand in the way of receiving what God promised and intended for us to have through the resurrection of Christ. He goes on to quote as he's closing. It almost feels like Paul just wraps this up and then begin walking out. You know how like when church ends and we're all kind of walking out or we're hanging out as we're moving out the door and conversations are still happening. The church service is over. The preaching's done. The altar time's done. I don't know that they did altar time just the way that we did. In fact, I'm sure that they didn't. But as Paul preached and led them out, he gave them a warning. Okay, so in verse 41 of Acts 13, he says, Look, you scoffers. That doesn't sound like a very politically correct way to win your audience. You know, he didn't read Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People, apparently. Uh, Look, you scoffers. But he's quoting scripture. Wonder and perish, for I'm going to do something in your days that you would never believe, even if someone told you. This is a... Uh, quote from Habakkuk chapter 1 verse 5 
when God was telling Israel if they refused to believe in him, that he would do something surprising. He would raise up a leader from somewhere else. In fact, he did, Nebuchadnezzar. And so he's saying that would have surprised you. Even if somebody had said it, you wouldn't have believed it. So he's saying to them, and they got the message. They were going along. They wanted to hear more on the subject, maybe because Paul scared them a little bit, saying if you don't trust in Jesus, then... Um, there will be judgment that follows. He's the only way. There, Mark says in his gospel that uh, anyone who believes will be saved. Anyone who refuses to believe is condemned already. Look, we shouldn't be upset by that. Jesus is God's answer for our sins. We shouldn't be upset that he didn't offer two ways when he's graciously offered one. A scoffer is a person who despises or feels contempt for someone. And these people could feel contempt for what God was doing through Jesus. Many people were offended in Jesus. We understand that. Many people today are offended in Jesus. But I would challenge you, I would dare you to give Christ the opportunity to lead. We can't, we can't live in the kingdom the way that we should until we respond to him the right way. So what should we do with the resurrection of Jesus? Let me mention three things. And We'll draw this to a close. Number one, um, we should celebrate it. Okay, we're gonna we're celebrating today the resurrection of Jesus. This means God's welcome to us into the kingdom of God, and He's calling people from from every nation and language into His kingdom. I quoted earlier Matthew uh, twenty-eight when Jesus has risen from the dead in verse eighteen through twenty. He says, "All authority on heaven and earth has been given to me." All authority is mine. And now I'm sending you out as emissaries under my authority. And he says, I want you to go and make disciples of all nations, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded. In other words, Jesus is saying, I'm the rightful king of the world. I'm the rightful Lord of the universe. You go out and as part of your message, compel people to come in and live in the kingdom. Okay, That's the call is that Go teach them to obey everything I've observed you as saying to them, teach them to live with me as the rightful king. Okay. Second thing we should do, resurrection isn't just something to celebrate, it's something to proclaim. And it goes right along with what I just said, is that we ought to proclaim the resurrection. Somebody once said, you don't so much uh, preach the resurrection as you proclaim it. And I think the point here is that this is an event that speaks more profoundly uh, than we can articulate. I think there's more to the resurrection than what we're, we're realized. I think probably more than evangelical theology for the last 200 years is even giving credit to it for. Christ is king of the universe. This isn't just about dying and going to heaven that one day Jesus will be king. He's king now. And we live with him as king now. That's the call. This is the message of the early church. Not just that there's a God. That's such a lame, lesser message and even the demons believe in that, and they tremble. James is saying, if you have faith, you'll have works. He's saying even the demons, they believe, and they have a work, trembling. Okay, but that's such, uh, that's so shortcuts the gospel. We're not out there to get people to believe in God. We're out there to get people, when we're sharing the gospel, to, to proclaim that Jesus is Lord and to have them put their full weight upon him as Lord of their life. That's the call. So not just to get people to believe in God or even to believe that Jesus rose from the dead, but to apply their life to that truth and to live with him as their king. That's the proclamation is Jesus is king and he should be our king. And then the third thing is obviously follows on that step. The resurrection is not just something we proclaim, but it's something we respond to. So today I want to invite you, if um, you would trust Jesus as Lord of your life, as the true King who was raised from the dead. We believe Christians throughout uh, the 2,000 years of Christian history have believed that Jesus rose from the dead as a, ma as a fact of history. And not just that we believe this legend and this legend somehow gives power to our life and helps us get through the day in a gnarly world. It's more than that. It's we believe Jesus really rose from the dead, and if he did, he's proven himself to be king over this world. 
and he's worthy of our trust and following him because he will lead us not just through this world but into the next. Would you be willing today to put your confidence in Christ as Lord? And if you're skeptical about this, I invite you to the evidence. Look at the evidence that's out there. You can look to uh, the sources of history, Roman history, and you can see evidence of the resurrection of Christ. You can look to church history. It's not just as if this happened so long ago and then there's this black void that stands between us and that information. We have 2,000 years of Christian history. And the church hasn't always lived up to the, the power of the resurrection. But if we can look past the church to its Savior, I think we'll see something glorious there. He's worthy of our trust. Would you be willing to put your whole life on him today? Not, not just say, I'm going to become a member of a church. It's more than that. If you'll trust Christ, he'll make you part of the church. That's really a secondary concern. Trust Christ. Would you trust him today? Would you abandon the life of sin that you once lived, would you seek reconciliation with the God of the universe who wants to have a relationship with you through Jesus? Would you do that? Today you can. And I'd like to just let you know how. It's easy, to, it's easy in the sense of it's simple. It's not easy, I guess. Because what it really is doing is saying, I don't get to be in charge. And I think probably the biggest obstacle in our Western way of thinking is that we live in a democratic republic which means that we, we have the power to determine the course of our own lives to some extent, we think. And when we come into the kingdom of God, we don't get a vote on who the king is. He is the king. We've got to lay aside many of those democratic ideals and realize that we have to be a follower. And so it's a challenge to us. It's a challenge to all of us to lay down our lives to come and die. But what if we found out the very thing that we've really hungered for most in our life it's been the thing that we've held at bay because we're afraid to let go. Today, would you be willing to do that? Would you be willing to say, uh, God, be merciful to me. I've, I've sinned against you. And I believe that in the death and resurrection of Christ that you've purchased my pardon, that you've forgiven my sins, that you've welcomed me into the kingdom. Pray a prayer like that and just say, Jesus, be Lord of my life. That's the earliest Christian creed is Jesus is Lord. And it meant so much. It meant more than just saying he's really elevated. Uh, it meant that he is king of the universe. Okay, so I would like to invite you to do that. Father, we ask right now that those that are watching as part of the Maranatha community, Lord, those that are beyond the scope of our, uh, our gathering, Lord, that are watching uh, on the internet or wherever they may see this, Lord, we pray that you would impact their life, Lord, through this message. I think there's, there's such a great call here, but this is not just a call to make a decision and then walk away from it and be the same person. This is a call to give our lives to you. So there are some that are saying yes to you right now in their heart, and I pray, Lord, that you would reveal yourself to them in a special way. God, that you would show them not only through the evidence of the history that we have through you, but also through the internal witness of the Holy Spirit and the shared witness of your people, the church. I pray, God, that you would save someone today from their sin, turn them to you, we believe you're risen. We believe it changes everything. And so, God, I pray that you would impact hearts and lives wherever they're hearing this message. And I pray that some new birth, some new person could come into the kingdom by declaring their allegiance to you as Lord and King and Savior today. Be merciful to us, Lord. And we're so thankful that you did come out of grace and mercy. You didn't count our sins against us. You took them yourself so that we could be forgiven. And you pronounced our jubilee, our freedom. And we're asking, Lord, that you would apply that to lives in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Zach's going to lead us in a song. Amen. And all his 
history shall bow before your throne. Time and space on bended knee shall come. Though kingdoms pass away, your majesty remains. How great you are, how great must be your song. Alpha and Omega without end. The everlasting makes this rich is The angel standing on this beggar heart responds. How great you are! How great you must be! your song you're the hymn of the ages the hope of all the world you carried our redemption on your shoulders you're the anthem of salvation Jesus Lord of Lord you're For a countless choir in my lungs To sing your praises with a thousand tongues The purpose in my days Is ever to proclaim how great you are how great must be your song. You're the hymn of the ages, the hope of all the world. You carried our redemption on your shoulders. You're the anthem of salvation.
you've had a great time uh, celebrating again with us today. Uh, let's remember the th uh, three things that we want to do. We want to celebrate the resurrection. We want to uh, proclaim the resurrection and also let's respond to the resurrection because it's the uh, vindication of Jesus as Lord. We want to live with him as Lord. I hope you're having a great time with your families uh, celebrating. Uh, we can't wait for the time that we get to meet back together again as the church. God bless you. Have a wonderful Easter.